We worship this morning according to the common service on page 15 in the front of the hymn. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. pray. O Lord our God, govern the nations on earth and direct the affairs of this world so that your church may worship you in peace and joy through your Son Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our Old Testament lesson for today is from Isaiah chapter 55, beginning at verse 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, 
So are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So far, the Old Testament lesson. Our psalm of the day, these words of Psalm 37, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. So far, the psalm of the day. And our epistle lesson is from James chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Do you think scripture says without reason that the spirit he caused to live in us tends toward envy, but he gives us more grace? That is why scripture says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. This is the word of the Lord. Alleluia. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel is written in the 11th chapter according to St. Mark, beginning at the 20th verse. Now in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed is withered away. So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive forgive your trespasses. This is the gospel of the Lord. You, Let us join in confessing our faith according to the words of the Apostles' Creed as printed on page 19 in the front of the hymn. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Our text in our continuing study of St. Mark's Gospel from this 11th chapter. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you will have them. Now in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. Last week we witnessed Jesus do something which at first glance seems rather petty and petulant. On his way into Jerusalem on the Monday morning after Palm Sunday, he approaches a fig tree along the roadside because he's hungry he wants breakfast the tree is in full foliage it should have been loaded with figs but when Jesus comes to it he finds none zip zero and so to the astonishment of his disciples Jesus lays a divine curse on the fig tree let no one eat fruit from you ever again his disciples are amazed. Now Jesus is not picking on trees in a temper tantrum. He's making a point, an object lesson about the fruits that he expects from his own people. The kinds of things that freely flow from a real faith. Well now it's Tuesday morning. And on Tuesday morning, as Jesus is on his way back into Jerusalem with his disciples, the apostles notice that the fig tree is withered, dead as a doornail. Peter points, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed, it's all withered up. Standing at Jesus' elbow, as they have for nearly three years, the disciples are still sometimes astounded and still surprised at Jesus' power. Peter's remark has within it almost a veiled question, sort of like, how did you do that? And Jesus' answer to this is a stunning statement about faith and moving mountains about praying and having, about believing and receiving. Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Now, there is no dancing around these words of Jesus about believing and receiving. He plainly means what he says. But neither is this some sort of name it and claim it that you get from the faith healers or some sort of Jesus wants you to be rich from those grinning faces on the TV. Jesus is not some sort of big vending machine in the sky. And prayer is not like rubbing Aladdin's lamp to get God to pop out like some kind of genie to grant you your wild-eyed wishes. Christians who read their Bibles regularly, they know how the heroes of faith struggled with God in prayer. They remember the story of Joseph, enslaved and imprisoned in Egypt for years. Or Job, bereft of health, wealth, and children. Or David, hunkering down in caves every night 
while Saul's hitmen are chasing him. Or St. Paul, his ministry conducted amid persecutions and shipwrecks. We understand from the scriptures that we must go through many tribulations to enter the kingdom of God. But be that as it may, our Lord Jesus still says what he says. We do not need to pare the claws of the Lion of Judah. The essence of what he says is believe and receive. You may recall that Jesus said some astounding things about prayer. In the 16th chapter of John, he says, My Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Jesus said similar things many times on the pages of the Gospels. But we must be careful to look at what Jesus really says in such passages. For instance, Jesus is very fond of that phrase, in my name, whatever you ask in my name. Now, when we talk about the name of Jesus, we're not just talking about his, his title, such as Lord or Savior or Christ. Christ's good name is everything that he has revealed about himself on the pages of the Bible. And when we pray in Christ's name, our prayers are to be in accordance with what he has revealed about himself in the Bible, especially his life, his death, his resurrection, by which he has redeemed us. When you do something in someone's name, you are doing it on their behalf and in accordance with their wishes. So when we pray in Christ's name, we are harmonizing our hearts with God's heart so that we want what God wants and what he has revealed about himself. Sometimes we don't know exactly what God wants for us at a particular time in our life, but our prayers are not these hot prayers of selfishness which make endless demands and foot-stomping demands at God that he better want what we want and he better see it the way we see it. Real prayer doesn't do that. Christian prayer always recognizes that God's will is higher than our own, better than our own. So Christ's words to believe and receive are always understood by those who truly do believe in him and all that he says. Listen to his words again. Jesus answered and said, Have faith in God. For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you will have them. Jesus is not commanding his followers here to perform silly circus acts or to toss mountains like a Hail Mary pass in a football game. Jesus wants us to understand that our prayers to God are of such a nature that whatever he commands, whatever is in accordance with his will, whatever is for the best of his children, no obstacle is too great. He can move any mountain. He can do absolutely anything. In his words and in his promise, he says, I tell you, whatever th things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you have them. Literally, it's a past tense. Believe that you did receive them. What did Isaiah say? Before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. Every time you talk to your Heavenly Father, He's already there ahead of you. He already knows what you need. And He has already answered. Jesus said this, Your heavenly Father knows what things you have need of 
even before you ask him. Now, a child may prefer to have a video game. What he really needs are new shoes and socks. A child may whine for a candy bar. But of course, what he really needs is to eat his vegetables. A child may cry that he wants to stay up late. But of course, what he really needs is a good night's sleep. Your Heavenly Father will never do a number on you. He will never give you something that in the long run might actually hurt you. Have you ever found yourself after the fact sending up a sigh of thanks to God that he did not give you what you wanted at some particular point. Because that would have really been hurtful to you. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus put it this way, which of you fathers, if his son asks for a piece of bread, would give him a stone? Or if he asked for a piece of fish, would give him a snake. You wouldn't think of throwing a snake on your kid's high chair, would you? If you then, being evil, said Jesus, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your Father who is in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Our problem, of course, is we struggle with our sinful nature, is that sometimes we think that A stone is a piece of bread. Or we think that a snake is a fish. And so, Jesus has promised to help us. The Holy Spirit promises to translate our prayers into the ear of God so that we receive just the right thing all the time, in just the right way, as we trust our Heavenly Father, so that we don't end up with stones instead of bread and snakes instead of fish. Such is His promise to give all good things to His children. Believe and receive. We surely do. Nor do we wish to short-circuit those prayers to our Father. Jesus says, whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Christ's forgiveness does not merely flow to us from the gospel, word, sacrament, it also flows through us, to our brother or sister or neighbor. This is as simple and basic as the fifth petition of the Lord's Prayer, right? Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Now, we do not earn our forgiveness by forgiving other people. Christ earned our forgiveness totally 2,000 years ago on a cross. But to the extent that we appreciate it, the forgiveness that Christ has won for us, all that he has forgiven us, how much he has loved us, to that extent, we will also be able to pay it forward to our neighbor. To the extent that we ourselves fail to forgive, to that extent, we put a crimp in the hose of the pardon that we ourselves have received. We hold not just others hostage, we hold ourselves hostage. The last part of Genesis describes an episode in the life of Joseph. After Father Jacob died in the land of Egypt, Joseph's brothers said to each other, now Joseph is going to hold a grudge against us and pay us back for everything we did to him. Seventeen years 
They had lived in the land of Egypt while Jacob was still down there and alive. For 17 years, they had lived with unneeded dread, guilt, carping, anger, frustration, fear, all because they refused to believe what Joseph had told them in the first place, that he had forgiven them. We have a brother far greater than Joseph. A brother who has told us that he has washed away our sins in his blood. A brother who became one of us to live and die and rise again for us and to give us hearts that beat as one with God and to give us a brand new life. Now let's come full circle here. Why did this conversation about believing and receiving. How did that get started in the first place on that Tuesday morning when the sun was rising? It was because the disciples were astounded at the power of Jesus' word in cursing a fig tree. <coughs> the power of that word is still there for you and me. In the upper room before Jesus went forth to betrayal and arrest, he said something fascinating to his disciples. The Gospel of John says that Jesus told them, you will do the things I have done, you will do even greater things than these. And you say, come again? Christ believers will do greater things than he did during his earthly ministry? When have we fed the multitudes? When have we walked on water, cured a withered limb? Raise the dead, changed water into wine. What do you mean we're going to do greater things than these? But when Jesus ascended into heaven, he gave to you and to me and to all believers the power of his word, which works wonders that all the miracles he performed during his earthly ministry are nothing compared to. You see, when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, Lazarus got his physical life back for a while, for a few years. But when the word of God is preached and a baby is baptized or the body and blood of Christ are given in the sacrament of the altar, souls spring to life, a new life, an eternal life that cannot be interrupted even by physical death itself. In Ephesians, Paul says that the power that it took to make a Christian out of you or me when we were dead in transgressions and sins is the same amount of power it took to call Jesus out of his grave on Easter morning. That much power Christ has given to you and to me. The power of his word has not ceased. And as our hearts beat as one with his, that we want what he wants and think what he thinks, then we need not fear to ask. And though we see it now only with the eye of faith, Christ will, as Paul said, give us immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. It is true, though we see it only by the eye of faith. Christ pledges himself to it. Believe and receive. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.
Let us offer up our prayers this morning for Min Winky, who is hospitalized at Mayo in La Crosse, for Les Swigum, who is hospitalized at Gunderson in La Crosse, for Margaret Kirsten, who is now at Bethany Riverside, for Scott Herman in his illness, for Maynard Tauscher, who is hospitalized at Mayo in La Crosse, and for Gary Schrader in his illness. We pray. Compassionate Father, in your mercy, you transform even sickness and disease into a blessing for your children. With this confidence, we commit all those who are sick or suffering to your tender care. Provide healing and relief according to your infinite wisdom and boundless mercy. Grant patient endurance if their sufferings must linger. Help them find true spiritual strength through Jesus and his cross during their time of physical weakness. By the work of the Holy Spirit, teach them to trust in your forgiveness, grace, and love. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And we also pray, Almighty and everlasting God, who art always more ready to hear than we to pray, and art accustomed to give more than either we desire or deserve, pour down upon us the abundance of thy mercy, forgiving us those things whereof our conscience is afraid, and giving us those good things which we are not worthy to ask, but through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
Let us pray. Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace.